now move on to the second speaker today, and we have Hans Timmer, who is the chief economist for the South Asia region of the World Bank, a position he assumed on January 1st, 2019. Before that, he was the chief economist for the Europe and Central Asia region of the World Bank. So Hans will speak for about 15 minutes, and we would take two to three questions after that for him to respond. And this is also, we are very happy to welcome him for the third time at the uh, NEF meet. Good afternoon, uh, everybody. And, and thank you, Suji, for uh, inviting me. I'm delighted that this can be part of uh, my program here in Nepal. Uh, for the first time since COVID that I'm back in uh, Nepal, and it's really, really great to be here. Uh, what I want to do is first give you some observations at a regional level, the region of South Asia, because given what I'm doing, I'm more comfortable there. Then I will say something about Nepal, but I'm more cautious there because you in the audience, you know a lot more about Nepal than I do. Uh, and then finally, a few words about the really crucial role of uh, the private sector. But there I have to be cautious uh, also. So first, a regional perspective. Uh, let, let me start with an obvious observation, and that is that we are not living in normal times. And that means that business as usual solutions, they are not good enough. Why, why are we not living in normal times? That is because of the size and the severity and also the frequency of the shocks that the region, but also other countries outside of the region are, are facing. And, and so let's first take a, a human perspective. It's always good to start with a human perspective uh, and not with macroeconomic uh, statistics. So just think about the recent floods in, uh, in Pakistan. Uh, 1,500 people at least killed, hundreds of thousands of people that, uh, that have no home anymore, villages that have become islands in, the, in a sea, and it means that climate change is no longer an abstraction, but it is here with us. And that's the example of Pakistan, but you had your own floods, and increasingly you see that the climate shocks are becoming a reality. Then if you look at Sri Lanka, there, there is enormous scarcity. Uh, people cannot buy the necessities anymore, like uh, medication, just because of the size of a full-blown macroeconomic crisis and balance of payment uh, tensions. And then we have the war in Iraq that is one of the factors that is pushing up commodity prices, especially energy prices and, uh, and food prices. And that means that in the region, there are lots of households that are facing a decline in, in real income. And that comes all on top of the COVID pandemic that was a major shock to the region. For the first time in decades, a contraction of activity. Uh, scores of people lost their job. Uh, it upended the life of many migrants, uh, international and domestic uh, migrants. I think in Nepal in the first six months, uh, some half of a million migrants were uh, repatriated because they lost their jobs and with that their, their visa. And all these shocks, they have a common theme. And that common theme is that what we used to see as low probability tail end risks, they are getting a lot more appreciation and they are becoming more and more uh, real and more and more frequent. Uh, tail end risks like a pandemic, 
Nobody thought in decades before that you could have a pandemic of that size. The, uh, the war in, uh, in Ukraine, nobody anticipated that uh, years before. Uh, the, uh, the floods and the impact of, uh, of climate change. And then really a full-blown macroeconomic crisis in, uh, in the region. And we observe that the countries were not ready to absorb those uh, shocks. And you need different tools and different policies to be ready to deal with that. But also we observed that the poor people, they were really vulnerable in many of those shocks. And they were hit hard and they did not have the buffers. And so it is important to give them the tools to uh, react to those kind of, uh, of shocks. That's a human perspective, but you can tell also the story in macroeconomic uh, terms. And all those macroeconomic challenges that are related to those shocks, they crystallize themselves in balance of payment uh, tensions. So first of all, the rise in commodity prices, energy prices, those are commodities that have a low price elasticity, which means that the, uh, the import bill is going uh, up, leads to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, deficits on the current account, and that leads to balance of payment uh, problems. Then you have the, the rising fiscal deficits because of the relief effort in er earlier shocks, especially uh, the pandemic. That translates also in current account uh, deficits. And then recently you have the spending of the pent-up demand. People couldn't spend during the lockdowns. They were forced savings. But now that money is being spent, hopefully that's a temporary phenomenon. But as a result of that, you have large declines in the current account deficits. And then on the financing side, you see the tightening of monetary policies in the rest of the world, which makes it much more difficult to finance these current account deficits. And then for many countries, you see that remittances and tourism have not recovered uh, yet. And so we have a macroeconomic uh, problem that requires that governments are rethinking their macroeconomic policies. The, uh, the tools that they have on the monetary side, on the fiscal side, and how they can create the, uh, the buffers again to be flexible to react to this kind of a situation. But the balance of payment uh, uh, tensions means also that many more countries are coming to the IMF. It's a majority of the countries in the region now, including uh, even uh, Bangladesh. So that is the, uh, the regional uh, picture. So how do I see Nepal in, in this picture? Uh, and as I said, I feel a little bit shaky here with all of you knowing more about Nepal, but from a distance, Nepal looks relatively good in this picture, in the sense that the risk in several other countries are higher. Why is that? Uh, first of all, because uh, accumulated debt is relatively low in uh, Nepal. Uh, that is easy because then you don't have a debt service problem uh, to deal with, but it's also easier because, easy because with low debt, you have more flexibility to address the flows on the balance of, uh, of payments. Uh, you are in an easier uh, starting position. Uh, another reason why it is relatively easy in uh, Nepal is because at least official remittances have remained uh, surprisingly strong. It is not completely clear whether that is partly because of a formalization of remittances and so that perhaps the informal remittances did decline. Some of the uh, rapid surveys that we have in households, including in Nepal, they show that households they feel that their overall remittances have declined, but in a macroeconomic sense, the formal remittances have been relatively stable. And then a third reason why I wouldn't uh, call Nepal as the most risky country at the moment is that Nepal does not depend 
as other countries so much on the import of, uh, of energy. Uh, and actually the high energy prices in the medium long run can be a benefit for, uh, uh, for Nepal as it further develops its hydropower uh, capacity. So on first sight, Nepal is doing quite well, but still it faces the similar kind of shocks that makes us live in unprecedented times. And then when you look a little bit further, there are some caveats. And let me start with the caveat on the fiscal side. Um, I, I think there is a trend now towards more sustained large fiscal deficits, and that is probably related to the federalism, where you see that more money is needed for the provincial and the local level, while the spending at the central level is not uh, declining. That's, in my sense, the, the, the most serious problem. You always have uh, fiscal expenditure just before elections, but those are temporary phenomena. But the trend towards larger fiscal deficits, they are a problem, uh, th that's problematic. You, you don't have then the flexibility to react to those uh, shocks. Uh, uh, another uh, reason is uh, that uh, with the remittances, uh, you have a very peculiar structure of your economy. It is basically creating Dutch disease. Uh, it means that you are not competitive uh, in international markets, and uh, uh, as an unavoidable uh, result of large remittances, uh, your exports are very small. That means that with policy measures, it is very difficult to solve your problem with rapidly uh, rising uh, exports, because you start from a, a low uh, base. Uh, then uh, you have a fixed exchange rate vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Indian uh, rupee. Uh, in my personal view, that might actually make a, a lot of sense, but it does limit uh, your, uh, your flexibility of, of monetary uh, policy. Uh, it is, uh, there is still some scope for, uh, for monetary policy, but it is limited, which means that uh, there is a big role to be played uh, by uh, fiscal policy, but if you're starting to run large fiscal deficits, then you don't have that, uh, that scope uh, anymore. Uh, so there are concerns uh, also in Nepal, even if in the short run you are not one of the countries that run the highest risks of not able, being able to cope uh, with these overall uh, shocks. But then uh, my final, uh, uh, I don't know how many uh, minutes I left, uh, two minutes, four minutes I, I have left, uh, so I will stay within my time. My, my final observation is about uh, the, uh, the, the private sector. Uh, and that is because every major crisis and we have seen major crises now, they come with opportunities. The world is never the same. There are new opportunities created. There is suddenly an awareness of new problems and new solutions are coming. And in my view, uh, the, 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 the private sector has a big role to play there. And, and, and one of the biggest problems that was revealed, in my view, was the fact that the economy is not inclusive enough. Not enough people are in a productive way participating in the economy. The informal sector is very large. Uh, as a result of that, uh, many people, many small firms, they don't have the tools to, uh, to cope with the big shocks that are coming uh, to them. And, and ultimately, the solution is that these small firms and individuals, they have the buffers and they have the, the tools. It cannot all come from social security, uh, uh, safety nets uh, organized by the governance, uh, government, although that is very important uh, also. And, and one of the solutions 
to increase that inclusiveness is coming with the crisis also, and that is a new technology that got an enormous boost during, uh, during the COVID period, and that is the dig digital technology. With the lockdown, the digital technologies became a lot more prevalent, and, and that is actually a unique opportunity for informal firms to become more productive uh, perhaps not by really entering the formal sector and having to meet all the formal uh, restrictions, but increasingly being able to participate in e-commerce platforms to have access to digital, uh, to digital finance, and as a result of that, starting to participate more in markets, uh, increasing their uh, productivity and building up uh, uh, reserves. And, and, and there is a big role for the private sector to be played there. Because as a result of your very specific structure coming with the Dutch disease of a relatively small private sector, not really competitive in international market, you don't have a lot of competition in the current private sector. There's limited uh, competition. And and you have to be open to increase that competition and to, to, to find ways to absorb more small companies and more people in the private sector so that the, 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 uh, the underutilized capacity that is there is being unleashed and ultimately you have a, a much more vibrant sector. That is the positive story that is coming out of, of all these uh, crises, I think. And, and so you all know that the government has this strategy and we're working with that because we use that acronym also in the World Bank of the GRID, uh, the, the green, uh, the resilient, uh, the inclusive uh, development. That is a very logical reaction to this crisis because we now all realize that you can't avoid moving into a greener economy. That is very important, adaptation and even mitigation uh, on the climate change uh, side is very important. Resilience uh, is important, resilience to these, uh, these floods, the environmental shocks, but also macroeconomic uh, resilience. Uh, but then the I stands for inclusion. Uh, and ultimately, I think that is the most important lesson from, uh, from all these crises, the realization that uh, not everybody was participating in this economy and that it is ultimately the enlargement of the private sector and the increase in, pro uh, in productivity uh, that will do the trick. And so it is up to you to make that uh, happen. Uh, thank you so much. I, I think this was 15 minutes. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hans. So, I, so why don't you stay on? Uh, which we have uh, time for two questions, and please raise your hands. And if you have some pertinent questions you would like to ask Hans, so yes, sir. Thank you, Ms. Hans. Quick question on uh, the lack of fiscal property in Nepal. How does the World Bank look at that? Lack of fiscal property. Uh, property. Uh, basically, lack of uh, um, um, discipline. <laughs> so that's an area we, we just uh, uh, met uh, the governor of the central bank. We, we met uh, the Ministry of Finance earlier. Uh, that, that's an area where I think it's still work in progress and it's related to, to federalism. Uh, there, there are uh, not necessarily all easy answers to this uh, because other countries that try to go in the direction of federalism, they are struggling uh, with this also, uh, especially clearly defining the division of labor between the central level of provinces and then uh, the local level. And so I think that's that unclarity, it's one of the reasons why you see the, the increase in the, in the spending. Uh, but I think uh, there's also a need for a much clearer fiscal structure on the expenditure side. Uh, where are the responsibilities? Where are uh, the trade-offs? Uh, 
but then uh, also we talked a lot about increasing uh, uh, the revenues. Uh, uh, and, and then uh, finally, as, as part of a much better macroeconomic uh, uh, policies, uh, uh, there's also a need uh, to, to move away from uh, what I would call command and control uh, solutions. Uh, so when you see imports rising, we just restrict imports of certain uh, uh, products, or uh, when, uh, when, when, when you see uh, 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 an increase in, uh, in credit supply, then we are just directly intervening, or when you don't see enough credits to certain groups, we are intervening. So instead of ad hoc interventions, you need a structure uh, that, uh, that uh, I see the IMF is agreeing with me, but uh, you need much more structure. Uh, I, I don't blame the government. I think that they, they have come quite far in the last five, six years, moving towards federalism. Uh, but uh, it is not on track yet, and it is really important to get this on track. Yeah. Thanks, Ansia. Yeah, I think we would be talking about that in the next session I have with Teresa. Yeah. Bless you. Thank you, Shijal. Uh, very interesting presentation. Thanks, Hans. I'm just wondering, you have hinted that the fixed exchange rate is a problem in Nepal. Uh, particularly, we are having a, such a long uh, border, open border with India, where there is a free movement of people and everything. In that scenario, can we have a flexible, I mean, open exchange rate with India? So, so basically, he's talking about um, fixed exchange rate, and then you have open movement of people. So how does that you know, sort of relate? Yeah, especially with India, the open border and fixed fix exchange rate. No. Two observations about the fixed exchange rate, and that's where I might disagree with the IMF. I don't know. We haven't discussed that. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I wouldn't dismiss the logic of a fixed exchange rate at hand. There is an enormous close interaction between the economy of Nepal and the economy of, of India. And in those cases, uh, it might be useful not to bring in the volatility of exchange rates with potentially also speculation that comes with, uh, with flexible uh, exchange rates. So, so there might be a logic there. And uh, if the structure of economies are also very similar, uh, both importers of, uh, of energy, uh, then uh, that, that might all make a lot of sense. Uh, but that doesn't mean that Nepal always is hit by the same shocks. It depends more on the remittances. Uh, and so it, it comes uh, with uh, a problem when you are uh, when, when you're facing different shocks. But uh, my, my first inclination uh, would be to try to make the fixed exchange rate work. And I think still that is possible. Uh, when you have a prudent fiscal policy uh, and uh, you keep the current account uh, with uh, flexible prices and prudent fix, uh, fiscal policies under control, then uh, you can make a fixed exchange rate work. And I would even argue that using the reserves as a buffer to make it, uh, it, it work uh, is not necessarily uh, bad. And I was actually impressed that when during COVID, the current account improved because people were unable to spend their money and consumption went down and imports went down, that that translated in an accumulation of reserves. If you can accumulate reserves in good times, 
then you can use those reserves also when you're being hit by a temporary uh, shock. So that's, so that's my, my, my first point. Uh, I'm not arguing immediately with a fixed exchange rate. Now, then there is that story then when you have very elastic capital flows uh, that uh, a fixed exchange rate means that you have no freedom in your monetary policy because you can't set independently an, uh, an interest rate uh, and you just have to follow the interest rate of, uh, uh, of central banks abroad. And perhaps that's where your question is going when you have a lot of people moving over the borders and they can bring uh, money back and forth, uh, then uh, your independence uh, of, of uh, monetary policy uh, is no longer uh, there because immediately it will be uh, uh, it, it will result in uh, in a capital flow across uh, the border. E even there, I'm not that concerned because first of all, I don't think we should overestimate uh, these flows. And there is still a possibility to have an interest rate differential, differential, which means that you can use your interest rate to react to uh, domestic uh, developments or an, an external shock. And if it were true that these flows are completely elastic, then you wouldn't have to worry about the balance of payment at all, because then you can solve every deterioration on your current account by just slightly increasing your interest rate and the money uh, will flow in. And then when uh, you have an improvement of your current account, then the money will automatically uh, flow out and you shouldn't be concerned about, uh, about your reserves. So I, I see the, the problem of an... Uh, uh, of a fixed exchange rate. It requires a lot from, uh, from fiscal uh, policies. You limit yourself. Uh, I, I understand that, but we shouldn't uh, overestimate the problems. And before we start attacking the fixed exchange rate, we have to think through what a flexible exchange rate would mean for Nepal and what it would mean for speculations and changes in relative prices that are not consistent with uh, equilibrium uh, real exchange rates that you would need to clear the markets in, uh, in Nepal. Thank you. Thank you, Hans. A round of applause for Hans for his